right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today, we are doing something totally unique in our history here at this program. Uh, we are highlighting some really, really cool ancient history. So we are joined live all the way in Rome, Italy, one of the most historic and beautiful cities in the world, by Darius Aria. So he is an archaeologist, a TV host, presenter. He is obsessed with Rome, and he loves sharing that with the world in so many ways, whether that's on the History Channel, National Ge Geographic, PBS, or through the American Institute of Roman Studies and his um, of Ro sorry, American Institute for Roman Culture and Ancient Rome Live, which is the fantastic platform where he shares all sorts of amazing stories um, from the streets, from his home, from all sorts of places across Rome and the Roman Empire uh, with you guys at home. Again, first time we've ever had him here on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, so I'm excited to dive in. Um, I hope you guys are super keen too. And without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Darius, and take us away. Thanks a lot, Jesse. It's great to be here. Uh, so as you can see, I am in Rome and uh, I live basically down the street from the, the Colosseum. So when you live in Rome, uh, you uh, are exposed to history every single day. That's really why in my professional career as an archaeologist, I decided to live in Rome. Uh, it was just a chance to really interact and work and excavate and teach for now about 20 years. Uh, and uh, it just makes me the happiest person as an archaeologist. Uh, and, and then now my kids are growing up with this. The interesting thing is I feel like I, I never take any of this uh, for granted. They're growing up with like, yeah, yeah, we have the Colosseum. Oh, there's the Circus Maximus and all these entertainment venues that we're going to be talking about today. But it's funny because uh, maybe for some of you, other than the Colosseum, a lot of these locations won't be that familiar to you. But when you grow up here, you everyone is in tune with who the Romans were and what they built because so much of what they built has been left behind, has been incorporated into new spaces, have been repurposed into churches, and all that kind of recycling of history is also a really exciting thing, not just in Rome, but wherever the Roman Empire was. So I'm going to just walk you through some locations and some ideas and give you a sense of how people, and in particular kids growing up, what did you do for fun? So let me uh, share the screen here. Because, I mean, let's face it, they didn't have TikTok, they didn't have iPads, they didn't have Netflix, they didn't have a lot of these uh, you know, movie theaters, all these venues today and these things and handheld devices that we're used to, they didn't have. So what did they have? Okay, well, the first thing I'm showing you is uh, a bunch of young uh, ladies, girls that are playing and one of them is bent down dropping something. She's dropping down knuckle, bo uh, knuckle, um, knuckle bones. So you actually take the knuckle bones of animals like a pig and you'd clean them off and you'd shape them and so forth. And then you're gonna throw them. I mean, they also had dice. So again, maybe doing this as a pastime today, you could say, ah, that sounds so boring. What am I looking at? But if you, well, maybe the parents that are tuning in here, or you've seen a James Bond movie and you see James Bond at the craps tables, when you see them rolling the dice and uh, every single number, every combination meant something. So for the Romans and the Greeks, they associated it with gods, they associated it sometimes with drinking games, they associated it with uh, you know, money and betting. So they were having a lot of fun for hours and hours and hours, and just with you know, knuckle bones. Uh, here are guys that are playing uh, just on a Greek vase, and uh, it looks like they're playing something like either checkers or if you've ever played backgammon. So like my heritage is Iranian and I grew up playing backgammon and it's an old, old game. And if you ever try it, checkers, chess, backgammon, you'll see that if you get into it, again, it's something that you could do for a very, very, very long time. Uh, in some cultures, they have tea houses and people just sit and as we say, chew the fat, you know, just talk about politics and what's going on in life and how are the kids as they play this game. 
but you can really get engrossed in it. You can get, I mean, you know, really into it as much as you can say today that you're getting into making that TikTok video or you're into, you know, playing that video game or whatever. So these are really engrossing things that are a big part of people's lives. Then we can now pass to big monuments. So when we talk about Rome and we talk about the Greek world, what did you do to be entertained in a large venue? We're gonna to get to the Colosseum because everybody knows the Colosseum. It's the most iconic uh, monument really from the ancient world. But this thing, if you look at it, kind of looks like a little Colosseum. This is not an amphitheater. This is not a place where gladiators fought. This is the theater. So maybe today, if you think about the theater or the opera, you think, well, it's kind of fancy and all this sort of stuff. But the theater in Roman times and Greek times was for everybody. And you went inside and you sat according to your status in society. So the senators, the people involved in politics, they have like some of the best seats and, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the anybody, everybody, uh, they're gonna be more in like you say, the nosebleed seats, but everybody had a chance to come here around what? Around a religious festival, around a celebration of a victory, around maybe an anniversary of a, um, uh, of a, um, you know, family member of, of the emperor. This one here is called the Theater of Marcellus. So it's named after the nephew of the Emperor Augustus. So who is Augustus? He is the successor of Julius Caesar. And I bet probably everybody watching has heard of Julius Caesar. And we know what happened to Julius Caesar in the Ides of March. He was killed by his fellow senators. He pushed the envelope. He was basically trying to become a king, not very acceptable in a republic. He was killed for it. There were more civil wars afterwards. And ultimately it's his successor, Augustus, that does successfully establish a monarchy. And he builds a lot of monuments. This is one of them. And just think, Rome had three theaters in ancient Roman times. What kind of theatrical production did they have? So you want to think of it on the full range of what you see when you go to a venue. Uh, they have actually specific venues for music, but you could think about this as performance spaces where it goes from the kind of high end, high brow, kind of formal presentations and theatrics and all the way down almost to what you'd call stand up comedy today. So a lot of satire, a lot of, uh, you know, some of these more for everybody kind of uh, performances. And that's something that you really look forward to on these occasions of a religious festival or some sort of victory of the Roman state. And what you see on it today is a palace. So over time, the empire falls apart. Rome is really no longer important. Fourth, fifth, sixth centuries AD. And what do you get afterwards? In the aftermath, people go to these buildings that were built really well and built something new on top of it. So this is a Renaissance palace that sits on top of a monument, which is 2000 years old. Okay, this doesn't look like much per se, but this is part of the remains, the imprint from the Circus Maximus. The Circus Maximus, all you gotta do is say Ben-Hur, okay? So you take yourself to this classic movie with Charlton Heston, and there's a guy racing around in a chariot. And normally, it's something like a four horse chariot. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's eight, once it's 12. But you can imagine these guys racing around. The chariots itself are so tiny. It's more like, it's more like someone uh, uh, surfing on a, on a skateboard or a wakeboard. It was that compact. And you would literally tie yourself to the reins, to your body, you're so connected with your team of horses and people get killed all the time. So this is way more dangerous than the people with all the technology and the race cars of today. So you had a, you had a dagger uh, on your, basically in your pocket, like your breast pocket, so that if you started to get dragged or you fell off your chair or whatever, you had to cut through the reins. Otherwise, 
you'd be trampled to death or you get dragged to death or whatever. So there's a lot of drama in that space. And that space had seating for up to 200,000 people. We're gonna to get to the Coliseum. The Coliseum held about 50,000 people. This was a venue that held maybe 200,000 people. So go through in your mind all, all the incredible sporting venues around the world, how many people can be held in them. You can go to maybe some places like some of the race, uh, race car areas or the, um, you know, the horse races, the Kentucky Derby or whatever, but this had seating elevated seating all the way around the track, which is half a kilometer long. So 545 meters, that's about, it's over 600 yards long, all compacted. Okay, here's another space. It doesn't look like an entertainment venue, but it was. So the fantastically long space here, it's about 1200 feet long. It was for Greek athletic competition and the seating for 30,000 people, is the seating is basically underneath all the buildings uh, around the edge of that piazza. So over time, the space was remembered, but the seating has disappeared. Also because all the things we've been looking at, they're located in a floodplain. So what happens when the Tiber would flood? What's left behind? Destruction, mud. And, and so what it means is that a lot of these things disappeared or they're literally 30 to 40 feet below the modern street level. But we have the imprint of this structure. So imagine in this space, you had what we call Greek athletic competitions. And when Rome conquers Greece, they obviously adopt to keep a lot of those original ideas and traditions. So what does it mean? It means that when you grew up as a Roman, you did lots of things including Greek athletic performances. What does that mean? Wrestling, foot races, javelin toss, discus throwing. Sounds like the Olympics. So that's where we get the Olympics from. We get it from Olympia. We get it from this Greek tradition. But the Romans, as they conquer Greece, have their own kind of Olympics uh, in the city of Rome here in this venue. And at one point when the Colosseum was actually uh, damaged heavily in a fire. It took five years to rebuild it. What did they use? What venue did they use for Greek athletic, uh, for, uh, sorry, for gladiatorial games for five years? They used this, the Stadium of Domitian. That's the emperor who built it. So just think for five years, you would come not to the Colosseum, but you would come here to watch Greek athletic, uh, the Greek athletic competitions, but also the gladiators that you normally would see in uh, the Colosseum. And uh, now I, I'll just hold it here for one second. I'll say there are a lot of other venues, right? So, you know, there are activities in the streets. Kids would go off to the playing fields. They'd play ball. They'd, if they, if they could afford it, they'd ride a horse. They learn to swim in the Tiber River. I mean, there's a typical thing that you should do with your children, particularly we're focusing on the boys here. Uh, because they're going to be serving in the military. So the proper thing to do is teach your boy to swim because one day he's going to be crossing a river with his military gear on. You don't want the guy to drown. So learn to swim, learn to ride a horse, learn to use a sword, and then think about hand-to-hand -hand combat. So when you're a child, it's wrestling and running and et cetera, et cetera. So where were the playing fields? They're also located in the campus marshes, the field of Mars. Think about Mars, God of War. And over time, these places get filled with all kinds of fantastic venues. And famously, you have some of the great bath complexes. So bath complexes were places sure to get a rub down and go for a swim, but they were also gymnasiums. So you could lift weights, you could play ball games, uh, and they have many ball games. Uh, some games are kind of like rugby. Some games are kind of like soccer. And uh, it was just, again, a great place to go to and it's subsidized by, uh, by the state. So you kind of think it's like everybody could go to the Y, the YMCA, if I don't know if everyone knows what the YMCA is, I think so. But uh, you know, go to one of these places. It's not like an exclusive country club. There were those things as well. And wealthy people had huge estates where they could do everything you know, on their own. 
but everybody living in the first mega city. This is a city of 1 million people. They all had the opportunity to go to the baths, basically subsidized by the state. And the realities and their crowded apartment buildings weren't necessarily so great, but they had these parks, they had these baths. And of course, a lot of kids, as you know, in a lot of urban settings today, kids also just play in the streets or they play in the piazzas. So that's what would happen also in Roman times. So right now, this is a picture I took the other day. Rome has no tourists right now. Rome was just opening up. But uh, what it is, what it does have is still the local communities and the people are walking their dog and the kids are playing ball and, and you know, playing and having fun in the piazzas. But imagine it in Roman times or when we have tourists, how much more crowded it is. And then people are selling stuff in the streets and there are lots of souvenirs and there are tour groups and there's this and there's that. There's a lot of rabble. And that's what ancient Rome was like as well. Okay, now I just want to turn to this guy for a second because I also want to say one thing about who was Roman, who was enjoying these great venues. So Rome, sure, is a city state that ends up getting an empire, that ends up conquering everywhere around the Mediterranean, pushing all the way into Scotland, going all the way to Syria, dominating the Northern African strip, including Egypt, big chunk of the Middle East, even into what we call Saudi Arabia today. This guy, over time, uh, well, emperors are, and, and even before the emperors, the Romans are recognizing local populations and bit by bit, cities, allies of Rome became also invested with citizenship. And so over time, who the emperor is, initially just from Rome and just from Italy, are from everywhere. And by the time of this man, Caracalla, not necessarily, if you read his biography, the nicest guy, and he does have a pretty nasty end to his life, but he legalizes it so that everybody in the empire, 60 million people under his reign, they all become Roman citizens. His dad, there's his dad, Septimius Severus, is from Libya. His wife, the empress, is Julia Domna. She's from Syria. So I'm just giving an idea of how everything gets internationalized. And we want to think about the people of that city of Rome, but also throughout the empire, how diverse it was, how people coming from different backgrounds. This guy here is a Parthian. So he's basically from Iran and Iraq. Um, the, the different colored stones indicates foreignness, uh, but I mean, you know, they use black stone, they use yellow stone, uh, but he's not black. But what he is, is someone who's different. He wears pants. He's not wearing a toga. And that's another guy here, a Dacian, wearing pants, has a longer beard. He's being distinguished as sure, very noble looking, but also very quote unquote un-Roman because of what he is actually wearing. Here's another guy here with another kind of purple splotchy kind of marble, very expensive stuff, as expensive as marble could get, but you're showing many times, these are the people that we've conquered. These are the people that are now part of our empire. There's a bronze statue uh, of a Roman, uh, probably about 2000 years old. He still has his little pasty glass eyes intact. Okay, and a lot of activity taking place in the, in the Roman Forum itself. This is the seat of government. You can see the remains of lots of temples here. And in the shadow of all these colonnades and all these workspaces and law courts, people are buying, selling, trading, uh, you know, a lot of street activity, a lot of street, you know, the, the jugglers, the, the people that are trying to entertain you, the buskers that are trying to make some money. So there's a lot of life and a lot of entertainment going on all throughout the city. Now let's in the end turn to this place. This is the Colosseum. This is built between 70 and 80 by the Emperor Vespasian. You can see here there's work in progress. This is actually a big hole being dug for a third metro line called Metro C. And you can see right here again, not too many people are, are, are around the Colosseum right now. Uh, it's kind of an ideal uh, time to take a picture. And uh, it just opened up to the public this week. But you can see here how magnificent, how massive this structure is. Uh, this is a, a vantage point. I was up on the scaffolding when they had some scaffolding on the outer wall that's up to 50 meters in height. And you can look down here and you can see part of the floor has been reconstructed, but the other part underneath the modern reconstructed floor where the gladiators would perform 
you have all kinds of little shafts where little elevators would hoist up and bring gladiators, stage props, or wild animals. So this was kind of the ultimate venue. Uh, again, from my vantage point here, standing 50 meters up, you just see how tiny the people are, how massive the structure is. And I hope for a lot of you, you'd say it has a pretty modern feel for it. You know, feel for it. Like if you go to a, a stadium ever, and this is like the blueprint, this is the, the model, which everyone is looking at. Here's when the scaffolding was up to give you a sense. Then of course, it's a broken monument. It's an ancient monument that has seen a lot and it goes out of use in the sixth century. It's built to the end of the first century. So it doesn't have a long life in use. Most of its life has been as a ruin and then people pilfer it, take away metal clamps, take away stonework and so forth. And that's why it's in this broken fashion today. But the, the entertainment that takes place inside in the morning, men fight against wild animals. That's kind of like the warm up act. At noontime, you execute criminals. We've been executing criminals publicly and civilizations for as long as there's been civilization, right? You can think about the different places around the world and different times, the guillotine in France or however, you know, horrible, horrible things. And for much of the history of humanity, people have gathered to watch it. So you're watching it in Rome inside the Colosseum as entertainment, because this is a way that you're exacting justice and those people are bad and the state is good. It's for entertainment value. But then the main act is the gladiators. Remember, these guys are slaves trained like a, a, any professional sports person is trained and they know the art of using the different uh, weaponry and they're putting on a good show. Probably the death rate, the mortality rate in any uh, fight is something like 10%. So it's not 50%. It's not that one guy's gonna die every time and, or be put to death. But 10%, those aren't good odds. I would not want to be a gladiator, okay? I hope you guys don't want to be a gladiator. Okay, so anyways, here's again one of these uh, great views. And I want to keep in mind that things like the Colosseum did not exist in isolation or in a bubble in antiquity. So right down the street, there were four gladiator schools. I don't know how old you guys are all are, but if you're old enough to see the movie Gladiator, the main star, the protagonist, he's stuck in a gladiator school. He was stuck in this one, the Ludus Magnus, the great school. And there were four of them in Rome. And this is, had a underground passageway. It still connects to the Colosseum because gladiators were dangerous, trained killers. You had to lock them up after the performances. And of course, it's in that venue in the movie that Maximus is going is to try to escape from. Uh, so anyway, keep in mind, see these great massive structures of ancient Rome, the baths, Circus Maximus, the Colosseum, uh, the Stadium of Domitian back there at the Piazza. Nothing really existed in isolation. There's so many other structures, so much other life that's involved in. Again, we talked a little bit about the diversity, the people's backgrounds, people coming to Rome because there's opportunity, there's a way to uh, improve your, your condition, there's a way to you know accumulate wealth. Uh, get your kids an education and so forth. It was a real magnet. People come from all over the empire and ultimately they're all Roman citizens. They're all part of that great idea of what ancient Rome was. Fantastic, Darius. That was so cool. Wow. I... Uh... I learned a lot. I'm sure the kids are as excited as I am. And the questions pouring in on YouTube, what I love with presentations like this is that it's just like this endless stream of questions. So we're going to have no problem uh, occupying the next 20 minutes. Um, for everyone on YouTube, if you haven't said a question yet, just let me know where you're joining from. Nice to hear where kids are joining in from. And I'll share as many questions as I can. For Miss Rigo's class that's live with us, there's two ways you can let me know you have a question. There's a way to raise a little blue hand beside your name here in Zoom. If you do that, I'll know you have a question. You can also type in the chat bar just to everyone or directly to me. Just, I have a question, and then I'll come to you and you can say it live to Darius. So our first question, uh, of course, about the Coliseum, you ended up with that and we inspired a lot of kids. So who built it? Like, was there a specific person that led to its creation? And, and how long would it take to build something like that? How many people are involved in that process? Yeah, so, uh, okay. So we have this this uh, this venue here, the, the Coliseum is a replacement of a previous 
uh, amphitheater that had, that had burnt down in a fire, the Fire 64, uh, built by uh, uh, Nero, but had basically built a stand in one uh, in wood. But this is the, the final venue, and it turns out to be the biggest amphitheater ever built in the ancient Roman world. It's built by Vespasian, the new uh, emperor at the time, between 70 and 80 AD. So it only took 10 years to build. How many people are involved? It's very difficult to estimate, but, but we have one great uh, recent study done by a real engineer who's also an archeologist looking at the baths of Caracalla down the street. Anyways, based upon some of her studies, you could estimate something like at least five or 6,000 people were working on this around the clock for about 10 years. So you need to go backwards in time and think about, they have to quarry, they didn't go to Home Depot. Okay, they had to go to the quarry and extract the blocks. 100,000 tons of travertine stone were cut from a quarry. We know exactly where it was. Put on a river called the Anio, which flows into the Tiber, which then comes down the street from the Colosseum. Then you've got to drag it in carts, 100,000 tons in carts pulled by oxen. That's just to get the uh, travertine block, but the whole interior is bricks that are fired and baked, and then we have the concrete. It's very impressive in engineering, to say the least. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. So you talk about uh, you talk about the fact that the Colosseum is, is such a, a modern template for for sort of modern stadiums, and it does. It looks like our, our Blue Jays, you know, Sky Dome here in Toronto. Um, how are we getting these blocks from the river to the place? I mean, you talk about drawing it on oxen carts, but Rome is, is known for its roads. Could you explain a little bit more about how Rome sort of set the stage for a lot of yeah. uh, modern day life for us? It's an incredible, incredible road network. And there are plenty of other ancient societies that have great uh, road networks from Peru to China to, I mean, just everywhere. But the Roman road system, the amazing thing is so many of the roads still exist. So they got to the point where it was all roads lead to Rome. And it, it's really true. And, uh, and you still have these 24 roads leading into the city. They're the same ancient ones. Uh, and, and it was a great network. But when you think about how wide the average road was, the typical road is wide enough for two ox carts to pass. So they're not like super highways of eight lanes or something like that. Occasionally, there's a big wide road. But normally speaking, they're just they're not that big because it didn't have to be. All right, uh, very cool. Well, we're gonna take more questions on YouTube. Ms. Rigo's class, don't be shy. Let me know in the chat bar, share questions and I'll pass them on to Darius. Uh, but our question uh, from Braden Ertl is, why were the Greeks in Rome or, or the Romans in Greece? Or like you, you talked about this sort of cross-pollination of cultures. Why were these people there in the first place? Right, so yeah, nobody, nobody ever existed in a bubble. So think about Rome, where it is in Italy. They were surrounded by people in that boot, the shape of Italy. Uh, by people with diverse backgrounds speaking different languages, the Etruscans, the Veliscans, the Uskins, the Sabines, the Samnites, so the, the people in Sicily. And then in the 8th century, right as Rome is getting its start, remember 753 BC is the foundation date, already in the 8th century, the Greeks are coming over, individual Greek city-states, and they're founding colonies in southern Italy. So Rome never exists in a bubble and suddenly goes over and conquers Greece. They were interacting with Greek ideas, Greek mythology, Greek taste, Greek culture, right from the beginning. But what happens is Rome dominates uh, by the third century BC, they dominate all of, conquer all of Italy. So they're conquering all these uh, Greek cities in uh, Southern Italy and, and Sicily. So there's always a mix of culture and ideas and they go over and beat up the guys over in, uh, in, in Turkey and Greece and bring over people as slaves, but they also bring over culture, libraries, art. So there are different ways in which they're interacting and absorbing all of this culture. So any educated person in Rome spoke two languages. Every educated person spoke Latin and Greek. So when we study the classics today, like I have a, I have a PhD, you had to study some Latin, a lot actually, and you had to study Greek, you had to do both. And that's the culture. It was a bicultural society, but the official language when the Romans were in charge was Latin. So you get a, you get a mix and, uh, and you have to think of it as a, it's something very interesting and organic and, and, and dynamic. Um, anyways, it's, it's, it's really worth investigating, getting more familiar with that. 
your passion is so infectious. You love all this. It's so fantastic. Oh, it's good stuff. There is. Uh, uh, speaking of languages, there's actually a great question uh, Ms. Rigo just typed in. So I'm going to go to her directly to, to share it because I think it's uh, one we really want to take. So Ms. Rigo, go for it. All right, thank you. Um, so my question is, I know you've been talking about uh, Rome being a very diverse place. How progressive was Roman, ancient Roman society in terms of um, when they allowed newcomers to come into um, the city? Uh, how progressive was the city in terms of allowing newcomers to speak their own language and practice their own religion? That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, okay, so. So we have two bodies of information that we can then look at to answer that. One is we can look at the inscriptions from those people, like the immigrants and say, or the, and people coming over as slaves, getting freed, and then you know leaving behind a tomb. And the other thing is we can look at the written stuff that we have uh, that's been copied over you know, a zillion times in the, in the uh, Middle Ages. And so we have a lot of the text of the ancient authors. So, and, and, and a lot of them are mostly like the upper classes. So you kind of get like a, you know, a very particular view on the everybody of society. So you're gonna get biases, you're gonna get kind of like, oh, those guys from Gaul, they have terrible Latin accents. So you're getting that kind of pushback. And you're getting those weirdos over there, um, they worship this particular God, that's just so strange. But, but the reality is over time, we see that a lot of religions and ideas, and ultimately a lot of the provinces are gonna be exerting over time more and more of an influence than on the city of Rome to the point that then Rome isn't even that important anymore. So by the time we got this huge great empire, Rome was really getting marginalized and it's more about the idea of Rome that were part of the Roman empire. And then emperors aren't, you know, it wasn't even necessary to be in Rome that much after a certain point. So definitely I think that the realities are, there's gonna be some sort of pushback and the, the reality in the street would be, well, you're not really a real Roman. I've been here for 10 generations and I'm descended from this deity, you know, like Julius Caesar is an old family descended from Venus. Well, that's great lineage. But uh, on the other hand, people rolled up their sleeves. We see it time and time again as freed slaves and they start their business. Many people became quite wealthy and left behind and told their stories. Yes, they were allowed to worship their gods. Yes, they were allowed to keep their traditions. But there's also that bit of, I want to be a part of this Kind of great thing of what what Rome is, and I'm going to be able to at a certain point vote on uh, you know and 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 voice my uh, opinion and so on and so forth. And there's the Republic. So I think that it would have been a it's a very complex uh, question, and then we have to look at the sources and take everything kind of with a grain of salt because everyone's giving us just a little piece of that puzzle. But I think it would have been as dynamic as any situation that we can envision today. Like here, I'm an, Amer I'm an Iranian American, come over to Italy, I live here, my kids are being raised here, but I can say it's like, I've got the whole thing of like, oh, you're an American, and then it's kind of like, oh, you're not Italian. Boy. So there's a whole kind of my own perceptions of being like an outsider coming into society, being accepted, but maybe not totally accepted or in different ways accepted and so forth. I mean, it's just any, any immigrant story, we're going to have, you know, positives and negatives and so on and so forth, but that's... That's what makes up any, uh, any society. And then we're gonna leave behind and make the statement of, this is how I felt included or not. And this is how I wanted to improve the situation for other people. So I, you, know, I, I, you do get some of that. You do get some of that uh, from ancient Rome. And that's why I think it's worthwhile looking at it, looking at this empire. Now, this history is so rich. I mean, you've shared so much already, and I know that we're barely even scratching the surface here in one session, that's 25 minutes. How do we know all this? Like, were there certain people that chart, like was Rome, really efficient and effective at, at you know, keeping written records of these sort of things that we do understand all this history or how is this charted down? So what, okay, that's a great question. So we have monuments like behind me, the Colosseum. So number one, we have incredible archeological remains. We have Pompeii, the miracle of Pompeii is how it was preserved, the destruction from Vesuvius and Herculaneum, Herculaneum. Uh, and then we have all these written sources books and books and books from the Greek and the Roman world, incredible things that when we get into the time of, of the rise of the church and they're trying to contain this knowledge, they, they are no Xerox machines. They couldn't photograph the documents. They took the time to hand copy document after document, tens and tens of thousands of pages. So the reason why I you know, grew up and study this stuff is that I'm lucky enough that there was 
in the aftermath of the, in the fall of the Roman Empire, there were people that said, this stuff is still worthwhile. This poetry is beautiful. Uh, this history is worth, this knowledge is worth, uh, medicine is worth uh, preserving. So that's a huge thing. And then we have the archaeology. We have people unearthing still today, still yesterday, some new thing was found, a mosaic was found, a statue was found, a new city was found, and new interpretations. We're using new technologies to analyze the, the DNA of, of the bones of the people left behind that didn't even have a voice. Now they have a voice because we can say they ate this, they had this medical condition, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there's just so many exciting ways which we can learn more about these people from a long time ago, probably more than any other ancient society. I mean, there's a reason why we gravitate to, to Rome. It's not just because of the Colosseum, but it's because we have all, the, all this extra knowledge. The tens and thousands of, it, of statues in, in, uh, in collections like in the Vatican uh, and the Capitoline Museums and so forth. I mean, it would just, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming what we have to look at and to be inspired by. Very cool. There it is. This is awesome. Um, you, we talked about conquest a bit. We talked about uh, Roman troops going to other places around uh, you know, Europe and beyond. And one of the questions from Alexandra online is, what's the youngest age people can be to fight in wars in ancient Rome? Is there Ah, great question. Well, basically, um, you just have to be a man now. Let's look at societies, let's look at religions, let's look at you know, different traditions of when you become a man in, in religious practice or in society today. So, and I grew up in the States. So, I mean, you're serving the military as young as 18, and then, you know, obviously you can drink alcohol at 21, so we don't have to get into that. But the issue is there is a kind of a cutoff. So for the Romans, it's more like 15, it's younger because what do we have in society today? This kind of idea of you have to get training, you have to go to college, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that's the kind of, and so you're spending more time learning something before you can practice it. For the Romans, of course, the life expectancy was really short. Imagine if the average, the average guy is going to die in, uh, you know, mid 40s. That's, that's terrible. Who wants, that's a short life. But for the Romans, that was the fullness of life. You had to give it your all. So you, you couldn't do what I did in being graduate school to your 30. I'd be like a grandfather at that point. So you did everything sooner. You became a man sooner. You served in the military. You had children. So, I mean, typically, you know, girls are getting, uh, you know, betrothed to be married when they're 12 and 13. So, but imagine also the mortality rate of children, the women dying in childbirth. It was devastating. So you had 10 children and maybe two lived to adulthood. So those kind of extremes are, you know, just also, you know, shed some light on the fact that it's a different kind of reality. I mean, they had no, you know, modern medicine. There were no vaccines and they did face pandemics. So it, it, a lot of drama living in antiquity. And yet still we had this mega city of, uh, of Rome sustaining a million people. You didn't have a city with a million people until the uh, Industrial Revolution. So it really was quite an achievement and worth studying. <laughs> I love this, this dichotomy between like how enriching and exciting and all the stuff that's going on and also how totally different it is from modern day life. And it's something that basically no one who's watching this program would ever want to actually live uh, because it's so outside of the realm of you know experience. But they really want that. I mean, there are books or movies or whatever, time machine. I vaccinated and <laughs> a medical kid or something I mean, you just would not you bring your own toothpaste because their toothpaste was urine right had the ammonium in your teeth you don't want to brush your teeth with urine right no so no. you bring your own toothpaste no. <laughs> different realities in ancient roman times uh that's funny uh all right uh, a great question about animals so you talked about the fact that the first show of the day would be people fighting wild animals what kind of wild animals and i mean this is an impossible answer i guess but how many animals would have died in these in these theaters yeah. in ancient rome we do have estimates on that so let's say um Okay, for the, uh, the greatest games ever recorded were under Trajan. Trajan extended the empire to its greatest extent. He's the emperor from 117 to, uh, uh, sorry, from uh, 98 to 117 uh, AD. And um, when he celebrates his victory, uh, I think it's something like, 
Uh, 10,000 animals are slaughtered over 100 days or so, and about 10,000 uh, gladiators are fighting. So then we turn to what kind of animals. So when the Romans start with this whole uh, games and killing and hunting down animals, it starts off with local game, right? So it's bears, it's, uh, it can be deer, it can be wild boar, very mean, very, very big, right? So then as they conquer the empire, they're bringing back all kinds of things, just like you'd imagine. The lions, uh, sometimes even tigers, uh, you know, just any animal that you can imagine, a rhinoceros, uh, elephants. There was one case where they had a killing of elephants and the elephants kind of rallied around each other and protected themselves and the crowd just had so much sympathy for these uh, these creatures that, uh, you know, it kind of backfired. It was kind of an embarrassing moment. Um, but, but generally speaking, any animal you can imagine was up for slaughter. Ostriches, uh, you know, hyenas, uh, giraffes. So just, to, just for the drama and also just showing how extensive the empire was that they could bring creatures you had never seen before. So very, uh, very dramatic kind of examples that you'd see in the Colosseum. Not the happiest uh, time or place. Uh, there is, um, amazingly, again, these sessions fly by. We're near the end of the broadcast. What I want to make sure we do is for everyone who's live on YouTube, where can they go to learn more about the work that you do um, and, and yep. learn more about Roman culture? Thank you. So, uh, well, romanculture.org is the nonprofit that I, that I run. And we have a weekly blog. Uh, we have ancientromelive.org where we have bi-weekly webinars, so live on Zoom uh, from inside some location in Rome, as well as a seminar style like this on Wednesdays and Sundays. And then we're producing a lot of videos in archaeological sites and museums uh, throughout Rome and Italy. So currently we're filming in the National Museum of Rome. There are four locations, all have archaeological sites uh, they're really amazing. So we just started filming this week, but we've been filming all over the city and even some places uh, throughout the empire. You can find them on our YouTube channel and that's just uh, youtube.com slash we dig Rome. I started a YouTube channel. It's my name. So youtube.com slash Darius Aria and uh, ancientromelive.org has more resources. So it has written resources, has photos, has bibliography and, and so forth. More indications on where to learn more. And then you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, you know Facebook. We do Facebook lives as well. So that all the call signs there are at Save Rome, and then mine are just my name. So reach out to me. I, I uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. We're happy to get more schools involved, and uh, just happy to share not just Rome, but just the the whole concept of Rome, its legacy, uh, and how it actually has an impact on the city uh, today. Uh, so it's, it's got far reaching implications. I think you can get answer and discuss a lot of different, uh, topics, archeology, span art history, architecture, engineering, uh, you know, music, uh, art, there's just so many things. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am so excited to do more of these personally, and I've already shared all those links in the chat bar to everyone on YouTube, so do check those out. Miss Rigo's class, I'll share them with you in an email when we're done. And if you have any more questions, please email them to me. I'll pass them along to Darius. We'll, we'll get you uh, those questions answered. And uh, we look forward to having you guys uh, get excited about Roman culture and, and wanting to learn more. This has been really, really fantastic. I'm so happy to, to have you in for this first time in our last few weeks before we wrap up for the year. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for squeezing me in. <laughs> what we do at the end of every session, I'm hoping this is going to work because it's iffy with demuting lately, but if all the students in Ms. Rigo's class and Ms. Rigo could join me in demuting their microphones, um, I'd love to say a big thank you to you for joining us all the way in Rome today. So you should all be demuted. Go for it, guys. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, we got a few more. There we go. <laughs> we'll stick with that. Thank you while people are trying to demute. Darius, uh, I really appreciate it. Well, I hope Thank you have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, you too, guys. Take care.